Uh, good to be back here at uh, Spegelsalen in uh, the Grand Hotel. Let's see, ah, there we go. Um, Finnish Biopower, we've been around, we were founded in 2016, raised our first money in 2018. We are now a team of 12 with operations in Sweden, Berlin and Switzerland. Um, let's just do a little backdrop. What it is it about plantable renewables and why do we need it? Um, you guys heard about the uh, energy transition, right? So these are numbers from Energi for Italien. So this is where we are now, consuming about 104, 150 terawatts of electricity, producing about 180, so we're exporting 30 or 40. If we don't invest in any new production capacity, by 2045, we'll have 40 terawatts worth of production capacity left. That's basically hydro, and maybe one or two nuclear, one nuclear plants. The need, at the same time, is is expected to be 330. Last week, we got the energy bill from the government, from the Swedish government. They said 300. Okay, so that's pretty, pretty, that's close enough. Now, there's a bit of gap here, as you can see. It's a kind of big one. And between now, 2024, and 2045, well, you all know the math, that's not a lot of years. And energy systems are built over decades, not years. So, by then, we need to build two Sweden of today in terms of consumption. Two Sweden. Because we're, I mean, every wind turbine you see out there is going to be taken down and replaced. Every single one. More, unless the ones that have been erected this or last year. All the biopower plants, most of the nuclear, everything needs to be gone. So, this is a lot. Now, how much is that a lot? Well, it's about 30 Forsmark nuclear power plants in production capacity, 30, or 21,000 onshore wind, power, wind turbines. Now, I hope you kind of get the idea of the, the, the challenge that we're facing. So it's not just a matter of, yeah, we're going to build one or two power, nuclear power plants. Dude, it's not enough. And it's going to cost any copious amounts of money. 1,000 euros per individual in Sweden every year until 2045. For Production and grid capacity. So, I think now we've kind of established the need for more renewable power production capacity, right? And our take on this is high efficiency biopower, where we can double the uh, electricity output from biomass compared to current technologies. And it's also an on demand technology, so you get it when you need it, not when you get it. There's a slight difference there. And we've seen that from our power pricing in, in Sweden over the past two to three years. In the summer, we've seen record low or negative prices, and in the winters, we've seen record high. And this picture is basically the same all across Europe, so this is not a Swedish phenomenon. It's, it's even worse in Finland, and it's kind of bad in continental Europe as well. And how do we do this? Okay, uh, traditionally, biopower is an advanced steam engine. You burn the fuel, boil the water, get steam, drive a turbine, etc. You get around 30% of electricity out of the energy content of the biomass. That's the conversion ratio or efficiency. We do it slightly differently. We take the same biomass and we pressurize it and then we gasify it. So you take the biomass, like this piece of wood here, and I heat it up to around 900 degrees, then it gasifies, it turns into a gas which is combustible. I inject some steam and then I, to cool it and then I clean it out for pollutants. Now I have a combustible clean gas which drives a gas turbine not a steam turbine, a gas turbine, which then produces the electricity. Through the integration that we do, we see that we get between 50 and 80% higher electrical efficiency from the biomass compared to your good old steam engine. And also what happens is the ratio between heat and power changes. Traditionally, it's like 30 heat electricity and 70 heat. We get about 50-50. That means I can get almost three times as much local power generation from a district heating grid in a township, wherever, and so I can produce three times as more local electricity, reducing my need for uh, transfer, and also increase the transfer capacity in the grids out there. And this in, it, in itself then drives lower cost of production compared to your in traditional technology. We want to build, do this, and uh, run this through uh, in plants, and this is an illustration of our smallest size plant. It's 10 megawatt electric or 25 megawatts of fuel. That is, in terms of electricity, it's 
eight to 10,000 households worth of production. In terms of district heating, it's about three or 4,000 single family homes, just to give you a sort of a mental idea. Uh, we're looking at three sizes. The, the P10, as we call it, is our smallest. And it has a lot of technical reasons and also financial reasons why we don't want to go smaller. Uh, we also have a four times the size, the P40. And then we have the real big boy at 100 megawatts electric. So it's about almost 200 megawatts of fuel. And when we plot the, the, the efficiencies that we calculated through our uh, projects and uh, modeling, we see that we're significantly, is there a pointer here? Yes, it is, but it doesn't work. Uh, we, significantly higher efficiency compared to this is, this is the blue ones are the traditional biopower plants that we have in the marketplace today. So it's a pretty big step up for the first, the launch generation, and then the, the more mature when we can go up in firing temperatures, more advanced materials, etc. In terms of fuel, what do we feed these things? That's a pretty common question that I get. Uh, we start out with uh, forest residues, grot in Swedish. Uh, we can also utilize pellets if that is available. Uh, we can also be, we will also be looking at return woods if those are available, especially the cleaner uh, fractions. But we are, all, we are also investigating uh, agriculture waste streams such as bagasse and corn stover, which is basically the part of the corn plant which you don't eat. And we see that these are global, globally available feedstocks. So this is not a technology designed for Scandinavia. It's a global technology. And that comes with, when you talk to the, I think that's the next slide. Yeah, here, in the next slide. Because we see two main applications for our plant. First, they have sort of the, you can call it the Scandinavian version. Combined heat and power. We produce electricity and district heating. And as we can see, I can produce three times as more electricity from the same district heating grid, since the ratio between heat and power is different. And I also get a lower cost of electricity produced. It's on demand. I can also operate it without getting paid for the district heating because my efficiencies are higher and it makes it more profitable. The other one, which is more uh, global, is the bio CCS or BEX applications where we, we work with negative emissions. So we have the, the plant, the traditional plant, but at the, at the back end, we put a carbon capture unit. So we capture the carbon, which was originally captured from the air by the, through the photo, photosynthesis, and then I get negative emissions. Now, the market for negative emissions is burgeoning. It's very new. It's not really there yet, but it's growing. There are copious billions of dollars in, or euros invested into the upcoming market for negative emissions. And we do believe that that will be the application for our technology for markets where there are no district, where there is no district heating, or you just skip the district heating to get a base load plant which can operate all year round, not being dependent on the seasonal functionality of the district heating. So these are the two main applications uh, that we see for, uh, before us, and we do believe that it's uh, well, lower cost of uh, electricity for both uh, applications, but also for the Bex plant, it's lower cost of capture compared to your current technologies with the steam cycle and capture at the back end. In addition to the, the two that I've just mentioned, biopower with heat and biopower with negative emissions, we can split apart our gasification unit and the gas turbine unit. And for the gasification unit, I can use that pr to produce carbon negative green hydrogen for industrial purposes or other industrial gases for industrial uses, for burner gases, etc. Or we can take the gas turbine, which has a very flexible combustion system, meaning that I can use different kinds of fuels without changing the hardware. And we've run tests where we've gone from 100% syngas to 100% hydrogen to 100% LPG and back. With stable flame, sub-PPM levels on NOx, and very clean uh, combustion uh, numbers. And that is, would, would then be a gas turbine you can use for peak shaving, to operate on biomethane, hydrogen, or whatever gaseous fuel you have available to sort of harvest those few hours that are very, very expensive, for instance. Or you can go in and offer grid services. And these are all expected to be huge markets out there. So this is, these, the, the whole bioenergy sector is growing two to four times that of the global economic growth. So this is really a growing marketplace. Um, 
We're now a team of 12, as I mentioned in the beginning. We have a very small board led by uh, Stefan Achilles, together with uh, Catalina. Uh, we have a very good functioning board. Uh, we are looking to expand that in the coming year with one or two people. Uh, we have a pretty vast background, both from academia and industry, uh, across different uh, disciplines. And we're actually located in a closed down coal fire power plant up at KDH campus. So it's, it's pretty fun to work in an old fossil plant developing renewable technology. And if you want to come visit, you're welcome. Taking us to commercialization, we go by way of what we call a demonstration plant. That is the smallest size plant, it's a 10 megawatt plant that we, it's a project that we are looking to commission that at the end of the decade or 2030 and goes through a two phase uh, mechanism where we first do the gasification and test it out together with a rebuilt gas turbine at lower scale. And in this case, we're not talking low, smaller scale in terms of size, we're talking pressure because the full operating pressure is 30 bar in the gasification. Here we run it at 10 bar, so it's about a third in terms of size and in terms of fuel. And once we've tested out the whole gasification and integration with the gas turbine and the whole BTC process, then we replace the first rebuilt existing gas turbine with the optimized gas turbine under development with our partner Zoya. And then we up the fuel capacity and the pressure to get a full scale operational unit. And by doing this in sort of a phase, rather than building first a pilot and then build a demo, we save about 300 million kroner and four years. So I think that's good use of funds. We are currently uh, looking to raise a seed round of 5 million euros. We are in discussions with a number of VCs. Uh, I'm happy to talk to more people. And the purpose of this seed round is to take the technology to what's called TRL5. And that is uh, validation in relevant environments uh, in terms of the gasification, the combustion, and the plant integration technology. And where we'll be doing a lot of our testing in Finland with VTT, in TU Berlin with, uh, uh, for the combustion, and also with KDH, RISE, and also internally. And, <clears throat> the perp uh, and we expect to complete this uh, project by uh, early 2026. Sooner if we, it's a matter of funding basically, how fast we can run and recruit our team. So that is sort of my key focus now is to secure this, uh, this seed round. And uh, we hope to close this out before we all go on summer vacation. And with that, I have about six, seven minutes left, and I think I want to open the floor to questions. Uh, and in the meantime, if we can get this going here, you can see a yes. little film here about what we see uh, could be a future plant. But Carlo, please, question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> um, first and foremost, China here I am, has here been I am, not there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> China has been an important target. Uh, for a future market, and you mentioned that previously uh, uh, in, in other presentations. Is that still the case, and has anything changed with, let's say, pandemics or, or macroeconomics? Uh, China is, together with India, extremely interesting markets. They have large uh, streams of potential fuels. They have a huge need to decarbonize. Um, China is very complicated from a political business and legal point of view, it's easy to get money in and hard to get money out. The IP question is also very difficult, but I do believe if you sign the right partnerships in technology transfer, just as we saw Metacon earlier today, you can do it. It's just a matter of how you structure your, 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 uh, your cooperation with the right partners, because you need to have local, you need to have boots on the ground with local partners that you trust. And the same thing goes for, for India. But there the sort of IP risk is significantly lower because they sort of have a Western take on IP mm -hmm. rather than China has a different one. But it would be fair to say that they really acknowledge uh, the problem and the situation. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it, it will be easy in an initial discussion to, yeah, to I get Yeah, I mean, I actually have, a, have a, one of many meetings with potential partners already tomorrow. So oh. I mean, it's, it's, these are always discussions that are ongoing for the, the various markets. Mm. That's sort of my job. 
And uh, <clears throat> you have recently uh, executed a sex sex successful string of capital injections with uh, Almi and, and convertibles, and and uh, you, you've been very busy, one could say. And this is matched by positive uh, results from uh, demonstration plants. So. And you mentioned here um, uh, a capital in injection. What can you tell us about the timeline going forward? Let's say uh, you, you close this successfully in the summer, and then we look forward for, let's say, a half year and, and the next coming 12 months. What shall we expect from you? Uh, it, it will be um, the first part of, uh, I would say, for the coming 12, 15 months. It's a lot of prep work. Mm -hmm. And then at the back end of 25 and early 26, it will be a lot of high pressure testing on both the gasification and the combustion side. So uh, unfortunately these things, the prep work is very extensive. Yeah. It takes a long time to get these things in, in place. And, and then once we do, then we do a, a series of testing, invest uh, in, in, in different kinds of test modes. We investigate different kinds of fuels, et cetera, et cetera, to, to do that. So, a year, year and a half from now, we are in the testing. We are into the testing in, in Finland and in Germany and uh, up in Sweden to take us towards the TRL5, as I mentioned. At the same time, on the commercial side, we are, we, we have, by then we have identified the site for this boy. Mm -hmm. And where we want to put it, it most likely is going to be on a, an existing energy uh, utility site so we can share permits, fuel okay. handling, etc., and a lot of infrastructure. Uh, but the idea is to identify the site uh, this year and start working with the, with the pre-studies and the pre-feeds uh, beginning of next year. And, and you mentioned before that you were in an, in an old uh, um, energy plant with the old uh, yeah. uh, energy sources. And also you, you mentioned uh, quite casually that uh, everybody's welcome to, to visit. But what's the address and how, how does one do when well, I want to see you uh, easy, in the flesh? E easiest way is just send me an email. Okay. Um, Henrik.bage at phoenixbiopower.com or info at phoenixbiopower.com. Goes to the same place, me. Uh, and then just we'll try to set up a time. Mm -hmm. and we're located at KDH campus. Yes. So basically, you take the tube to Tekniska Högskolan, and it's a 300 meter walk, mm. and we'll be there. So a it's, big it's, concrete block with its stack on it. It's it's quite close. And um, what what's the plan when it comes to going uh, public? Uh, and and. If one wants to invest at this stage in Phoenix Biopower, how should one do? So that's two questions. Uh, uh, in terms in of question. public uh, listing and floating, uh, had it not been for our dear dictator Putin, mm -hmm. we'd probably be listed by now. Okay. Because uh, uh, we had our site, we had a target set for late 22, early 23, uh, but that obviously didn't happen. Um, it, the markets. Uh, currently are not very well forthcoming mm -hmm. to pre-revenue companies, even though things are starting to happen. Uh, so it, I would be, I would think, it's hard to make promises, but uh, at least within two years, probably within mm -hmm. a year, depending on how the markets develop, uh, we could be doing. How do you want to do if you want to invest? Um, we are doing our seed round now. It's not a public offering that we've no. done before. So it's slightly limited uh, if one can go by way of uh, private banking services and then we can see if we can tailor something up. That would, that's one way of doing it. We have 2,300 shareholders. Mm. It's not uncommon that you want to reposition your portfolio. So there are a handful of people that are looking to sell small, small, uh, small holdings. So that, that can be sort of mediated. So the, the the key word here would be that uh, that there is a plan, but you're not ready to to, uh, to go public until you're ready, which I, I think is prudent. And also another reason to get in touch with Henrik Punk Bage at Phoenix Power if one has an interest. Yeah, phoenixpower.com, not the <laughs> yeah. other way. Around. All right, good. <laughs> well, the, the idea was here to repeat yeah. it and repeat it. Well, excellent. Yes. Uh, like this. There it is. Now you can all read. Yes. Now uh, we will continue uh, in a panel discussion, so we will dig in deeper. But uh, thank you very much, Henrik, and I think we'll give him a one warm hand of applause. Thanks for having me.